can hear you. I think we've arrived at the moment. And so if you would, please bow your heads with me and let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, yet again, you have graced us with your presence and you have blessed us with your word and revelation. Grant to us then your spirit, open our minds to receive and our hearts to believe all that you have revealed and all that you have given. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. <coughs> so we are still in Revelation chapter 1. Is what? Oh. That was my brother. Okay. So we are in Revelation chapter 1. And I want to go back. I think we got through about verse 10 last time. But I want to go back to verse 9. Because in 9, John is kind of organizing for us what this book is all about. I, John, your brother and partner in, and notice three things, tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. So why the book of Revelation? And why is it written not just in John's day, but why does it remain relevant in our day? And that is because we are all still living in the tribulation times. The tribulation times are those times of conflict between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of hell, between righteousness and sin. And especially it's a time of tribulation for faith-filled Christian believers because, go back to St. Paul in Romans chapter 7. Who are we? We are people who do not do the good we would and do the evil we, we wouldn't. We are always, the uh, kind of technical term for it, we are bifurcated. We are split in two. And that's what leads Paul to his, O wretched man that I am. Who can deliver me from this body of death, from this conflict? And his answer is, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the tribulation. The, yes, Chris. So, how many people say that Chris brings up kind of a great point that really divides Lutherans in particular, but um, I would say more conservative biblical scholars from that eschatological end of the world, um, seeing the whole revelation as linear rather than circular. And Lots of people have focused on, especially chapters 19 and 20 in Revelation. There'll be a thousand year reign of Christ. Well, we're getting way ahead of ourselves, but a thousand is a symbolic number. It's not a linear number. And too many, particularly unscholarly Bible numbers yeah uh, Bible teachers found disappointment in the ministry of Jesus because what didn't happen he didn't get to reign you know he overcame death in the grave Easter he ascended to the right hand of the Father 40 days later, but when did he get to sit on his throne? And when did he get to exercise power? That's right. Well, they just went and kind of read chapter 19 of Revelation and said, oh, he gets a thousand years of doing that. Now, let me ask you just a, a very uncritical question. If you had to live on this earth 
even if it is now more righteous than before or for a thousand years or you got to live in heaven for eternity which are you going to choose this this was bait and switch from the very beginning and it kind of took hold um do any of you own a Schofield Bible? No. Yeah. It was a biblical translation of about the mid-1800s. And he was what they call a dispensationalist. So there are seven dispensations. And the last word for him, we're in the sixth. The last one is the thousand year reign of Christ when Christ gets to put all his enemies under his feet. And guess what, folks? We get to reign alongside him and put our heel to the necks of all the people who caused us any consternation. Well, that was Schofield. <clears throat> so we look at it and we see uh, and we'll get to this in, say, Revelation chapter 7. <coughs> Excuse me. In 7, John looks and he sees a great multitude that nobody can number. And they are dressed in white robes. They are holding from Sunday palm branches in their hands. And the, uh, the angel says to John, who are these dressed in white, waving palm branches? And John says, sir, you know, which is a polite way of saying, explain it to me. Or if you're Lucille Ball, explain it, Ricky, explain it. <laughs> these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. And even now, part of what our rejoicing is whether you call it a funeral or a memorial service, is that a person who died in faith is not in limbo, but is actually dressed in a white robe, standing before the throne of God, praising God even now. And part of, like Isaiah, as an Old Testament prophet, part of the beauty of that life being lived even now while this world is going on is that they have escaped tribulation there is for them now no sorrow no regret no pain no tears no conflict and that's why we don't limit tribulation to a seven-year period or a thousand-year period it is the world in which we live right now. Great question. Yep. So, John says, we are partners in the tribulation, living a Christian life in a fallen world. We are partners in the kingdom, the kingdom that Christ has already established, a kingdom that is not yet realized on this earth, but is in reality in heaven. And finally, patient endurance. Now what does patient endurance mean? First of all, think about patience. Patience is waiting, right? You can have passive patience or you can have active patience. This term here refers to active patience. I'm willing to wait, but I am yearning. I am anticipating. I am eagerly awaiting what's been promised. And endurance, stick to itiveness. I'm not letting go. When we get to the, um, the letters to the seven churches, again and again, Jesus will say, the one who endures to the end, the one who doesn't give up, the one who doesn't, in kind of exasperation, throw their hands up in the air and quit, that one receives the crown of life. Okay? 
<laughs> so that's John's way or Jesus' way of kind of introducing us to what the content of this book is all about. So John is in the island of Patmos. Marcia was telling me this past week that she had actually been there. Oh, I, yeah, Karen, well, Karen's been everywhere in the world. <laughs> but um, it's a real place. It is very desolate. And um, again, that kind of, let's call it geographic information, ties us to reality. Too often, I think, people read the Bible <laughs> as if it started once upon a time in a land far, far away. Well, those are fairy tales. The Bible is not a fairy tale. It is grounded and rooted in history, in anthropology, the study of man, and in geography. And one of the wonderful things, if you take kind of biblical cruises or vacations, is you get to go and be where Jesus was, where Paul was, where the early church was. You're walking the streets, you're in the buildings, you're seeing the mountains, because this is real. This is not made up. This is not make-believe. Okay? So, verse 10. I was in the Spirit. Larry asked us about that last time. And in the Spirit, here really means Spirit-led in revelation. Doesn't mean out of body. Although it, it's kind of close to that. Um, you know, God gives revelation sometimes in vision, sometimes in dream. John just knows that in a unique and rare moment that he is caught up by the Spirit for the purpose of God revealing to him that which otherwise would not make common sense. Karen. So you think this was a uh, unique experience, not something that we can experience as Christians, we in the spirit? I, I wouldn't say not something that we can't experience, but something that we would rarely experience. It's not an everyday occasion. And, and that kind of goes back to, what was it, about a month ago? We were talking about people speaking in tongues and, and other manifestations of the Spirit. Well, for John, just the way he references it, this is not an everyday experience for him. It's unusual. I was in the Spirit, unlike I, I normally am when I am guided by the Spirit, blessed by the Spirit, the Spirit's present with me, uh, in worship and other things, it's it's more unusual is probably the best word I have for it. And it, it, it's what marks the revelation as so distinct from anything else that's happening around. This is intensely personal and very special. So it's not that it can't happen, and I'm sure it does to a lot of people, but it's not going to happen every Tuesday or every Sunday morning or every time that. It's going to be, I would almost venture to say, a once-in-a-lifetime experience, which would mark it as that unique. Let me get Karen and then Jim. Uh, yeah, it, you know, I, I think you can you can draw allusions to Pentecost uh, when the disciples are speaking, and the miracle is not that the disciples are speaking in tongues. The miracle is everybody is hearing them in their own native language, and so it's more ubiquitous. Um, we have a word in English. 
which is ecstasy. And ecstasy has a little of that almost out of body experience combined with great joy. This would be an ecstatic experience for John, being in the spirit. And in that sense, <clears throat> I'm sure the disciples had a very similar emotional response to Pentecost. Jim. Uh, I was just thinking there, Tad Mosby said it was pretty desolate and everything. Uh -huh. Probably no people or very few people there. It's kind of like a punishment, penal colony or something. Exactly, yeah. I was thinking almost like he's a hermit. You don't have much else to do except ponder. Be not, I'm not saying he didn't have this vision, but I'm just saying the situation he was in focus just on spiritual things or however you want to say it yeah and not be distracted by other stuff and and, and Jim's raising a, a valid point where in isolation and and not in the uh, the worries of daily affairs how am I going to pay the water bill you know is the electricity going to be on all that's removed from John and so there is kind of an opportunity in a way for God to really be heard because there isn't the noise around us. Um, my mom, it was something I started doing years ago that my mom utterly hated <laughs> and used to object to very politely and in a loving way, but you know how a lot of churches don't have big narthexes? So the narthex in a lot of churches is kind of like the entrance closet. You get 10 people in it, but then they either gotta go in the sanctuary or back outside. Well, that makes making people feel welcomed and identified and recognized really difficult because you're kind of in a position pastorally where you're passing people through because you got to get them through and again I'm, I'm, well, I'm interrupting myself and that's never a mental a sign of mental health I remember on like Easter and Christmas and things like that being at a big church that I always called a come-to church. So historic, multi-generational, grandkids came back to see the grandparents, and so you had huge services. Well, what was the first rule of the day? If you have a service at five, seven, nine, and 11, you need to clear the parking lot. Because you got a new group coming in. And I hated it because you couldn't just relax and take your time. You didn't want people just lingering in the sanctuary because there's another group coming. Well, back to the Narthex thing. I hated moving people. And so what I started doing, which you see me do most Sundays here, is I would walk <coughs> the sanctuary and I would talk to people as they came in. That's what my mom hated because <clears throat> me talking to people gave them permission to talk to each other and this was church and this was a sanctuary and it should be quiet as people prepare to worship i've heard it enough <laughs> and she was exactly right on one hand on the other hand one of the things that we lack that they didn't lack hundred years ago when everybody lived in the same town and shopped at the same general store and saw each other was community <coughs> and what I was trying to do was establish community within the church and in doing that I violated the sanctity of silence depends on what side of the argument you fall but um, how did we even get here <laughs> oh, yeah, Jim. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, but th there is something, and I would tell you, maybe one of the most important things you ever do on a Sunday morning, whether you have a lot of time to do it or not much, is before the service actually begins, pray to God for focus so that you are not distracted by somebody's perfume, somebody's cough, somebody's hairstyle, somebody's dress, I mean, whatever it is, because that is a unique time. And we need to be fully focused and fully energized for worship. And there are just far too many, you know, it's too cold. Trustees left the air conditioning on. It's too hot. Nobody opened the door. It's, you know, the devil loves to work with those little nagging annoyances. And so here, <coughs> maybe being in exile is a blessing in the sense that John really can focus all his attention and energy when he is caught up in the spirit. The other um, illusion I would kind of make to this is Paul. And I forget which epistle it is, but Paul is caught up into the third heaven. And he saw, it's what? Second Corinthians. And he saw things that were indescribable and heard things that were unmentionable. It was a spiritual envelopment. And it was, in that sense, an out-of-this-body experience. I think John's probably trying to describe something like that. Vern. My then is that Right, and, and Vern is referencing chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 2. And, and John makes mention of it again, which is what makes it not, and everybody has this experience, and everybody has this experience all the time. It makes it very unique and special. Carrie? Uh, kind of testing your limits here, but uh, do you... Do you believe there's such a thing as being filled with the Spirit for Christians? Oh, yeah. Okay, but, but, but it's very rare, or is it? Filled with the Spirit and caught up in the Spirit, for me, are two entirely different things. Uh, my first reaction would be to say that when you were baptized, you were filled with the Spirit. And God doesn't do things in partial measures. You don't get like 20% now and 30% at confirmation. And he doesn't dole it out. You are either filled with the Spirit, which means you have faith, you have salvation, you have a relationship with Jesus, or you are not. It's one or the other. Caught up in the Spirit is, again, I think that... I, I'm out of touch with all the stuff around me. I am now completely and totally focused, being caught in the spirit on things spiritual. Not a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And that's what makes it very unique. Uh, being filled with the spirit is, I think, a general Christian experience. Now, one of the things that we do ask, and I did the prayer that we began with, is to ask of God, liberally pour out your spirit. And, and that's not, give us more of it because we don't have enough. That's more, let us be aware that this time, this conversation, this place, is a spiritual thing so that we, our hearts and minds, are more in tuned with the Spirit. 
that we have, not that we need more of it. So it's quality, not quantity, if that be a good way to differentiate it. Go ahead, so one more. Think it's, so you think it's a one-time thing that happens at baptism and then it, all Christians are filled with the Spirit from that point on, as opposed to the special times of power that God gives, fills a person with the Spirit, uh, the, the, the power of the Spirit um, for, for, for a given purpose? Yes. <laughs> so, that, back to Carrie. If, when we come to faith, if we are filled with the Spirit, are there moments when the Spirit becomes more manifest or more prominent in our lives? And the answer is yes. There are times when, with spiritual gifts, very important issue, um, and, you know, in a way, uh, spiritual gifts kind of illustrate this. Is every Christian gifted by the Spirit? Yeah. Not all the same, but every one of us has a spiritual gift that God has granted for the blessing of his church. Are there times when that giftedness is more prominent or more on display? Yes, because of that unique moment when the Spirit is calling us, I would say particularly, to do something extremely challenging, out of our comfort zone, uh, out of the box. And, and there are tons and tons of people who will tell you, and it's go, going back to Jesus, when he said uh, to the disciples and to us, worry not about what you have to say because in the moment the spirit will speak through you now is that all the time no it's that crucial critical moment when the spirit i don't want to say takes over but manifests himself in such a way as to do something that you otherwise ordinarily wouldn't be able to do yeah That'd be a good distinction. Karen. Um, in, in verse 10, it says, I came under the Spirit's power. Now, did that last a long time? Or was it like a week? Or was it a few minutes? Or We have no idea. Okay. So Karen's question <clears throat> was, being in the Spirit, how long? And, you know, there are times when well, Roger, you'd appreciate this. Computers. <laughs> Remember back in the day when you were dialing uh, on the phone to hook up with something? And it would take forever to download. Or Jeanette's gone through this when the internet slows down a little bit and you want to download a podcast or something. And it'll tell you, It'll be nine hours, 15 minutes, and 34 seconds, or whatever. Yeah, and then there are moments when entire files just get downloaded. So we don't know. Um, what we know is John knows how extraordinary this experience and revelation is. And as Vernon was pointing out, that transition from chapter 3 to 4 is a really significant transition. Um, Jesus is going to tell John, write down things that are, things that, things you see, things that are, things that will be. It's another way of kind of organizing Revelation. Well, Chapter 1 is Jesus reintroducing himself to John. Well, who did John know? He knew Jesus of Nazareth bar Yosef. He knew 
the guy who came by the Sea of Galilee and said, follow me. And he and his brother James did just that. He knew the one, church calendar, who sat on a donkey and rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. And he knew the one who spoke from the cross, John, behold your mother, Mary, behold your son. So he knew that. He knew Jesus from the Mount of Transfiguration when the inherent glory that belonged to Jesus as the only begotten Son of God was suddenly revealed but then kind of clouded so that the disciples could actually be there. And he knew 40 days after Easter because he saw Jesus who raised his hands in blessing and then departed from them up into the clouds. And he remembered an angel who then appeared. Anybody remember what the angel said? Yeah, men of Galilee, why are you standing here gawking? Did you not know that he who was taken from you will in like measure return to you, the second coming. And Jesus, <clears throat> on trial before the Sanhedrin, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory and all the angels with him. Again, predictive of the second coming, the return of Christ. Yep. So, the transition here is Jesus introduces himself to John as the eternal Son of the Father in all the glory and majesty of heaven. Oh, different sight. Then in chapters 2 and 3, there are seven letters to seven churches. In chapter 4, we come back to that unique revelation again. And how does John introduce it? As Vern pointed out, chapter 4, verse 2, again, I was in the spirit and. So it kind of connects all these together. Was it in the space of a week? I think you could almost make an argument. 40 days and 40 nights? Just a good round biblical number? Um, I don't know. And nor do I think would John. You're making me think about this, but how many of you, I think everybody in here, has been under anesthesia? Oh, yes. And, you know, I can remember, oh, which doctor was it? It was a number of years ago, and I forget what was happening. But this doctor says to me, so they got the IV going and he's going to put the anesthetic or the anesthesia in. And he says, now, start counting back from 100. This is going to take a while. Yes. And I said, okay, 99. And I woke up saying 98. <laughs> <laughs> and he's laughing and it was funny. But yeah, I mean, how long? I have no clue. But I know I was not present in this moment. So, really good observation. Okay, so, verse 10. I was in the Spirit. On the Lord's Day, the Lord's Day is? Sunday. Sunday, how come? He rested on Sunday. Easter, yeah. Oh, Easter. And I heard behind me, so John's kind of, generally aware of location a loud voice like a trumpet now why is that important loud okay it's loud and trumpets are announcing yeah they're, they're for announcements they're piercing why is it that the cavalry with the prancing of horse feet and people yelling have a bugler and they blow charge or retreat or because even over the din of war you can hear a trumpet 
So it pierces through all the kind of, again, background noise or other things. It was a voice, a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. And then the seven churches are itemized to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. There will be a quiz at the end of the hour. <laughs> see if you remember all of these. <coughs> these are important cities in Asia Minor. And if you have a Bible with footnotes or a map, <coughs> you may see them positioned out. Ephesus is the, the city closest to um, Patmos. <coughs> and then they kind of go in a circle. I think the best biblical scholarship has identified these as postal regions. There are other cities. For example, Colossa, from which we get the epistle to the Colossians, is there. But it's not a postal district city. And this revelation was meant to be sent not just to seven churches, but to all the churches. Now here again is where biblical numerology becomes really, really important. Seven is the number of wholeness or completeness. That's why there are seven days in a week. And why the week didn't conclude on Friday, the sixth day, but on Saturday, the seventh day, even though God rested on that day, it still made a whole complete week. If you go back to the Old Testament, there was a Sabbath series so that everything was ordered around the number seven. Every week, the Sabbath was the last day of the week, Saturday for us. Every seven years was a Sabbath year in which the fields were fallow. They were allowed to rest and rejuvenate. Every Sabbath of Sabbaths, so 49 years, the 50th year was the year of Jubilee, where all debts were canceled, all enslaved people set free, it was a Sabbath of Sabbaths unto the Lord. And so all of Israel was kind of in this rhythm of sevens. And so here, seven churches is the rhythm of the early church, wherever it was found. Whether it was in a small house church, or a large congregation like Rome or Ephesus, it was seven. And that meant everybody, nobody excluded. Does that make sense? Okay. So we've got the seven churches named. Now, verse 12, John says, then I turn. So all of this was happening behind him. Now he turns to see the voice that was speaking to me. He didn't recognize it. Why not? It's behind him. Well, it's behind him? Yeah, okay, yeah. Didn't have his hearing aids in? <laughs> Remember, he knew the voice of Jesus of Nazareth. Who's speaking now? Jesus who has ascended to the right hand of the Father and is speaking with eternal glory and power. And on turning, I saw, here's number again, seven golden lampstands. Again, really important going back to the Old Testament. So, when God ordained the tabernacle, that's the tent, and then when Solomon built 
the first temple and when Ezra and Nehemiah built the second temple in the holy place, not the holy of holies, but the altar area, there was a candlestick. And on it were seven flames. That's where the menorah comes from. The menorah is a Jewish celebration <coughs> when they overcame the Seleucids and Tyaches Epiphanes III, there were two others beside him, uh, who had desecrated the temple, who had um, kowtowed the children of Israel, and under the uh, leadership of the Maccabees, a uh, priestly family in about 200 BC, they rose up in revolt, the Jews did, and they threw out the Seleucids. So now they're free and they're independent and they've got their temple back and they're ready to cleanse it and again begin the Levitical worship. Only there's a problem. And the problem is the golden lampstand. It takes seven days to purify and consecrate the oil that's burned in the seven flames of the candlestick. And they only had oil enough for one day. And so some advisors come to Judas Maccabees and they said, if we light the candle now, it's going to go out. It's like the eternal light that we have at the sanctuary. And that'll be demoralizing for the people. We should wait until we consecrate enough holy oil that we can keep it burning. And Judas Maccabees, in a statement of faith, said, God's house is free now. Why wait? light the candle and they did and miraculously so the story goes it stayed lit for seven days hence Hanukkah and um, and then they purified oil and kept it going notice this is different when God had but one people the children of Israel there was in the sanctuary, or before God, one lampstand. Seven lights, one lampstand. Now, in the New Testament church, God has many different people, lands, tribes, uh, tongues. So how many lampstands are there? Not one, there are seven. Again, the number the completeness of the church okay so John sees <coughs> seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands one like unto a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest now one like unto the son of man is taken from Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 it's a very important image in the Old Testament and it's an image that is very much like and you've heard me say this before the Greek word agape for love so the Greeks had eros romantic love, philos, friendship, uh, brotherly love, um, starge, which is esoteric love. I love good food, I love art, that kind of thing. And then they had this word agape, which nobody used. And nobody had a real good definition of until Jesus. And all of a sudden, he was able to take a little used word and fill it with his own meaning. Not a meaning that everybody else had. 
and he filled it with a sacrificial, courageous love, something that is from God, not from earth, not from man. So as God did that with vocabulary, here, God is doing this with a title. Because remember, the book of Daniel is written during the Babylonian captivity. That's like 586 B.C. And the scroll was read often. But nobody knew what one like unto the Son of Man was until Jesus defined it in messianic terms. Now, Old Testament Israel had messianic concepts. And you probably heard that you know, like David, they, they thought of a warrior king who would drive out the outsiders and the invaders, who would set up a uh, prosperous kingdom just for the Jewish people. Yeah, that was one concept. But there were others. And those other concepts were really hard for Jewish people to wrap their heads around. Um, on Friday this week, Good Friday, we'll be reading Isaiah 53, as we do every year. I told you my, my friend Rabbi Mendy refuses to discuss that chapter with me. And he knows it's messianic, but he doesn't know what to do with it. And he knows it is so overtly Christian and fulfilled in Jesus that he doesn't want to face it. But how do you square? Remember, we people, we want things to make sense. How do you square a victorious, conquering warrior king with the suffering servant of Isaiah 53? They don't fit until we get to Jesus. Nobody is seen both at the same time in the same individual. <clears throat> One like unto the Son of Man speaks to the dual nature of Jesus, Son of God, Son of Mary, but it speaks in a way that elevates humanity without denigrating deity. So, when do we kind of first encounter one like unto the Son of Man? When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar has them stoke in the fire with straw, and it gets so hot that the people throw in the straw are almost consumed and fall down dead. And Nebuchadnezzar, who's a little worried, finally, goes to look into the fiery furnace, and what does he see? Yeah, but before he sees him walking around, he sees not three, that's the number he put in, but four. And the fourth was like unto the Son of Man. It's the pre-incarnate Christ being with his people. Um, anyhow, so this term is, is perfect for Jesus to define what it means to be the Messiah and not fall into the trap of how other people have defined that term. So it makes Jesus very unique, but in a godly way not in a mental image or a presuppositional way. So I turned around and I saw one like unto the Son of Man. He's clothed with a long robe. Anybody know why that's, that's important? Two different kind of robes back in the day. People who worked for a living had short robes so they wouldn't get caught up in things. People who had a higher station, who were not at work, 
wore long flowing robes because they could. They wouldn't get caught in machinery. They wouldn't be stepped on by other people. Um, one of those things Pastor Bob and I learned a long, long time ago. If you, if you ever watch on Sunday morning, I shouldn't even be telling you this, but if you notice before I sit down on the stool, I always hike the back end of my robe up. Do you know why? Choking you. I, yeah, I, I don't want to short sheet myself. <laughs> And the most, most embarrassing thing I think I ever saw at an installation. <laughs> so the new pastor in front of his church, and they don't know him well, he's brought up to the altar and asked to kneel as the prayers are said and his hands are laid on him. And he made this mistake. He didn't tighten his robe and make sure it fell above his shoes. He let it, he went straight down and then it fell over his shoes so that when he was helped up, his shoes caught on the road, he was in about this position and all of a sudden did a backflip. Oh. <laughs> he was graceful, he popped up out of the backflip and said, and now for my next act. <laughs> And the church could appreciate he had a good sense of humor. But anyhow, being clothed in a long robe is, it's the mark of, well, royalty, we're not going to get there quite yet. Uh, it's the mark of having achieved. It's the mark of being beyond the ordinary. Okay, yeah, like a graduation gown. So what? He's arrived. Yeah, in a, a very real way. He's arrived. Barry? Um, you want to go so, back, don't you? Yeah. It sounds like a small thing, but the articles are inserted uh, in the translation. Uh, I, I have the NI, uh, the ESV, rather. Uh, it's not my favorite translation, but it's the one I have. It says, like a son of man. It's quite a difference from the son of man. Uh, and I don't know why the translators wouldn't have been careful to, to say the, making sure that it understood it's a reference to Christ. Uh, it sounds like an odd difference to have. I, I think, and, and Carrie's going back to verse, what verse is that? 10? 13. 13. Um, that he's, he's wondering why in the translation, and I don't know the Greek off the top of my head for this, why there is an indefinite article, one like unto a son of man, as if there could be more than one. And the direct uh, article, the son of man, particularly identifying Jesus in his messianic role. And I think the idea here is to go back again and lay hold of the Old Testament appearance of Jesus in the fiery furnace and Daniel's apprehension. Because remember, Jesus isn't here yet uh, chronologically. So when you look and you see, you don't know what you're seeing. It's kind of like a, a son of man. The Son of Man now receives the perfect identification in Jesus. And so I think early on here, what the translators are trying to do, and probably what John did uh, in writing this, was lay hold of the Son of Man concept from Daniel and bringing it forward now through Jesus to this moment of revelation. That's the best I got. <laughs> I think I'm okay. Think so. <laughs> so he has a long white robe. <clears throat> and what is around his chest? Golden sash. A golden sash. Does anybody have any idea why that's significant? If you go back Oh, 
Okay. Yeah, Jim's going back to uh, the monarchy. Uh, our images from England, and they, they always have kind of sashes. And sometimes in the movies, you'll see uh, ambassadors wearing that. That actually comes from, again, the Old Testament. And when God is describing for Moses the kind of priestly robe that Aaron and his descendants as high priest were to wear. They were to be long, flowing, and golden thread was to be woven in and around the chest. Now, yeah, now this, as Vern was saying earlier, this is Jesus with all his merch. I think that's the, the term the kids use, or all his um, regalia. What's the other word they use now? Accoutrements, yeah. Although I put those on salads. <laughs> <laughs> bling, you know. All the bling. He doesn't have just golden threads woven in the robe. He has a golden sash. So we're upping the ante a little bit. And John's already seeing all these Old Testament allusions that are now being fulfilled in the person of Jesus. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Is this the Jesus John remembers on the shore of the Sea of Galilee? No. Not at all. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. You can imagine how overwhelming this sight is for John. And he is, I feel, grasping for language to describe what he is seeing. Because he is seeing the Lord Jesus high and lifted up within the precincts of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I don't know how many of you ever get um, calendars or things from the Fort Wayne Seminary. There are two main classroom buildings. There's the north and the south. And in the north classroom building, there's kind of a sunroom. And these are all kind of A-shaped. They look like um, alpine skiing villages. And there is this gigantic mosaic, which is about two and a half, three stories tall. This is the mosaic. And just, we had to go there. There, there was no, nowhere to sit, but you kind of an open room. Not quite as big as this one. But there was a bench, and it was the only place to sit. And you sat under this mosaic of Jesus described in Revelation 1. Well, no, no, your back, your back was to it, but if you looked up, and, and it was etched in your, your consciousness, this was the place where the vicarage offices were, and where the placement offices were. And you had to go there for interviews and things like that before the two most important moments of your seminary life, where you went to serve on Vicarage and where you went to serve your first call. <clears throat> and it was awe-inspiring, and it was at times disconcerting to know that it was under the auspices not of, you know, we all love that picture of Jesus, the good shepherd, carrying the sheep on his shoulders, <laughs> or Jesus playing with the little children. Here you are before the one who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And it always made a, a very deep and abiding impression on me. And that's how, again, art in one image can express beyond 
all other ways what the written word can only partially describe. I'll see if I can find a picture of that mosaic for you guys. Okay. Kara, you're going to close us out. I think you said recently, maybe the last time you were together even, that uh, you understand that the Holy Spirit didn't tell uh, the writers what to say. Uh, but, uh, but here, and John was an unschooled fisherman. Uh, that he's writing like like a refined writer here in this detail. It, it feels here like like the spirit must have uh, uh, given him the word. I, and, and great observation. So Carrie's kind of peeling the onion of inspiration and of um, human involvement and and. Here's the distinction here. John is given the direction from Jesus, write what things you see and hear. Paul never says, I was dictated to by the Holy Spirit to write a letter to you Romans. So there is a difference in the literature, that the style, in the reason for the writing and I think, I think I would not be going too far in saying that the uniqueness that is imposed on John. So John's not writing like Paul, or he's not even writing like John in the epistles. He's writing spiritual things, things that have not yet transpired, things that have transpired but not in a visible way. The spiritual battle that is engaged all around us and we're oblivious to. Well, how do you do that? Holy men moved by the Spirit wrote as they were given utterance. And I, I think there's an elevated sense, and I'll end up saying that quite a bit in, in what we do here in Revelation but everything is ratcheted up. Or, you know, think of it as like revelation on steroids. There's been revelation, but not like this. And so there is kind of a uniqueness to that. And that's a really good observation. Okay, well, we've hit that time. So next week, we will finish Revelation chapter 1. <laughs> and there will be only 21 more chapters to go. So let's close with a word of prayer. Again, Lord Jesus, you gave your life for the sake of the church. You have reigned in heaven on our behalf. And you continue to guide, bless, and direct your people each and every day that we exist in this place and this time. Continue to be with us. Continue to watch over us. Walk with us in true spiritual humility as we gather to worship with you on Monday, Thursday, as we gather beneath your cross on Good Friday, and as we rejoice at the emptiness of your tomb on Easter morning. May this be a most blessed time for each and every one of us and for all your people around the world. For we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.